Welcome everyone. Another year, another event where we invite our clinic members to get to know what's happening in our industry. I'm very excited about today's uh, about today's uh, schedule agenda. We have a very <laughs> nice line of uh, guest speakers. We are going to be reviewing uh, very important topics that have a direct impact in our activities as an association, as uh, manufacturers, as an industry in home and building automation. So we're going to start with a, a guest, uh, which is uh, uh, brings uh, to the table a very hot topic, the European Performance for uh, Buildings Directive. Then we are going to discuss about the Cyber Resilience Act and then we'll switch to Kenex IoT related topics. First, Kenex IoT certified devices, first, Kenex IoT installation, uh, a panel discussion about the services, uh, um, discussions about the open source stack and uh, its adoption uh, for manufacturers. So it's a full agenda, full of content. Uh, I'm going to now welcome our first guest uh, speaker, Gas Kosovics. Managing Director, EU BAC, uh, a, a partner association that has been uh, directly involved with the European Performance for Building Directive. Welcome, Gast. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I think your topic is quite uh, interesting for our members because it creates a new business uh, opportunities uh, for our industry. And uh, I think it's something everyone is talking about, but not many uh, actually understand. So let's see if we can make this a bit more easy for our members uh, uh, today. This uh, EPVD, as it is known, mm -hmm. uh, presents uh, significant opportunities for uh, Kenex Association members companies uh, from infrastructure to advanced applications. Our members uh, integrated solutions address many of the key needs highlighted by the EPVD. So while this is uh, at the European level, each member state will adapt it to, into specific legislation. Uh, so with this session, we aim to deepen the understanding of how this directive will influence uh, the business landscape of our members and the potential impact of these uh, developments. So I make the stage yours from now, Cast. Uh, you can take uh, your time to do the presentation, share your screen, and eventually we'll have a, a Q and A at the end of the of the presentation. So thank you very much. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction and also the invitation. Um, first and foremost, let me compliment you on selecting such a historical date, also for for your event. Um, with everything that's going across uh, the pond today, so uh, very very well timed. Uh, let me try to share my screen so I can get my slides. Uh, sorry, I'm new to this platform, so I have to see. You at the bottom, there is a uh, share yeah. menu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got there. I'm just now trying to figure out how to share the entire screen. Okay. And now just to put on the presentation and that's, that's uh, the, the slides. Yeah, there we go. All right. Perfect. So thank you again. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first, a little bit of an introduction of us, who we are. I will not take for granted uh, anybody knowing us or, or what we do uh, at the European level. Uh, we are UVAC, as already announced, the European Building Automation Controls Association. Uh, we represent 27 manufacturers in the field of building automation and controls, and together we advocate for a world where everyone thrives in smart, decarbonized, and efficient built environments. So while today we're talking about energy performance of building directive, which uh, we advocated for in the, in the past decade um, at the European level, uh, we also try to do work at the national level, uh, because as many of you might know, uh, that's where rubber meets the road and actually the, the, the legislation gets implemented and we'll talk about that today as well. Um, so 
Uh, we advocate both at the European and national level, but of course, uh, beyond that, we also try to provide insightful information to our members in terms of what regulatory opportunities and barriers might come into the future. In the future, and we're also involved in standardization work um, and certification of certain products. So that's just a little bit about us. Uh, me, myself, Gus Kosovic, I've been uh, with Ubox since 2020. Uh, it's managing director for almost a year now, um, and. Um, yeah, let's get straight into it. So our main topic today, as already was mentioned, is the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Uh, I'll focus on some of the key provisions, which I think are important for our industry and also for you, uh, as we dub them the smart building requirements. Uh, on the top here, you can see a timeline. Uh, this timeline is here because, um, as some of you might know, but for maybe perhaps uh, some of you are new to this, um, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, uh, it's, it's in the name, it's a directive, meaning that it doesn't automatically apply across the EU, it needs to be transposed into the national law. So member states have a certain time timeline to transpose the directive at the national law, and then they have certain deadlines for some of the provisions to come into force. Uh, so Energy Performance Buildings Directive as such has been around already for, for over two decades. So um, it's developed a lot before it was uh, more of a recommendation uh, to member states and there's been more and more mandatory requirements that have come uh, with many revisions through, throughout the years. Uh, the last big one was in uh, 2018, before the current one. Um, and then we already got certain uh, building automation and control provisions into the directive. And with this revision, which happened this year, uh, which was adopted in May 8, uh, 2024, uh, the scope of these provisions got greatly expanded and other related provisions, which I'll uh, touch upon, such as smart readiness indicator, such as indoor environmental quality requirements and others, uh, got into the directive for the first time in a meaningful way as well. So uh, on the timeline at the top, uh, going from the left to right, the first thing you can see is the uh, 31st of um, December this year, actually. And this is uh, a set of provisions that already were required from the previous EPBD. Uh, and these will come into force at the end of this year, which are certain building automation control system capabilities. So if, we, if, if you know standardization, uh, the standard EN 52120 uh, class B packs uh, need to be um, in large non-residential buildings um, by the end of this year across the EU. Um, with the new directive, as I mentioned, this needs to be transposed. So the member states will now have two years to transpose this uh, or implement it into their national legislation uh, by, by May of 2026. And this is when automatically also some of the provisions which do not have a deadline in the directive will start to apply, such as uh, mandatory indoor environmental quality, monitoring and certain requirements at the residential level. I'll go into more detail in each of these a little bit later. From 2027, uh, we'll see also mandatory application of the smart readiness indicator in large non-residential buildings. And then in 2020, at the end of 2029, uh, the uh, scope of BACs gets expanded by adding also smaller non-residential buildings um, for mandatory application as well. But as mentioned, we'll look uh, closer to what each of these requirements mean to, to you and the products um, uh, that you represent as well. Um, in the meantime, we don't stop here. As I mentioned already, we're we'll working uh, with the Commission at the moment to draft uh, implementing guidelines um, and delegated acts, which are there uh, as sort of follow-up documents to help the member states um, understand these new requirements, uh, give them a little bit more context, uh, understand what sort of standards they should be looking at when they're uh, trying to implement this at the national level as well. So we're working on that level as well. At the same time, we're drafting in parallel also our guidelines and studies, uh, which we will communicate at the national level as well. And finally, uh, the Commission has until 2028 to review this directive again. Uh, this by no means mean, means that 2028 we're going to see a new uh, directive. Uh, not at all, probably not. Uh, this just means that the Commission at that point has to give its assessment at how the directive is meeting uh, EU's uh, goals and uh, then propose either say that it's well on the way and we don't need to add anything 
or um, propose new new suggestions at that point as well. Uh, but we are where we are today, so let's uh, let's get into a little bit more deeper in some of the provisions. As I mentioned, uh, there are certain building automation control systems requirements uh, that have been in place already, uh, which require uh, buildings by 2025 to be equipped with these capabilities ABC that you can see here on the screen. Um, within large non-residential buildings with an affected, uh, effective rated output above 290 kilowatts. Um, what is new with the new directive is uh, first the extension of the, scope, uh, of the scope of buildings that this is applicable to. So by 2030, uh, this will be in non-residential buildings with an effective rated output above 70 kilowatts. And on top of that, there is a new capability uh, which is coming, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, the directive uh, enters into force in member states uh, at on 29th of May 2026. So this will start applying from then, um, which is the monitoring of uh, indoor environmental quality as well. Um, so these are sort of the, the, the this is the main uh, topic that we were kind of advocating on, uh, both the scope and also some version of indoor environmental quality monitoring and control coming into the new provisions. Uh, so we're very happy we achieved this. But then, of course, as I mentioned, the question is what specifically uh, this means. Uh, there is some hint as to what uh, the definition of indoor environmental quality is in the EPBD. So this is for the first time included uh, as well in the EPBD. And it's huge because um, uh, as the name suggests, the directive is about efficiency, about building efficiency. Uh, nevertheless, for the first time, finally, also uh, the, uh, the stakeholders, the institutions have understood that they cannot sacrifice indoor environmental quality uh, for uh, building efficiency. So they have taken account of this. And there's a definition of indoor environmental quality for the first time, uh, which says that uh, it is the result of an assessment inside a building based upon parameters such as relating to the temperature, humidity, ventilation rate, and presence of contaminant um, influencing the health and well-being of its occupants. This is not an exhaustive list of parameters and not an exhaustive definition of indoor environmental quality. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, there's uh, different other aspects that are not even mentioned here uh, in this um, in this definition. Uh, therefore, uh, we are working together with the Commission on the guidelines which uh, aim to elaborate on this and give uh, member states more um, details on what standards should be followed and, and how to adequately monitor and assess this. Um, next, I'd like to mention another, um, uh, another area, which is the residential buildings, uh, which will have, uh, have to have certain functionalities, which we cannot control, uh, cannot call entirely building automation control systems because they're, they're less than that. Uh, nevertheless, there's uh, certain cap functionalities that will be required uh, by 29th of May 2026 in new residential buildings and when uh, residential buildings undergo major renovation. And you can see the definition of the major renovation on the bottom as well, in case uh, somebody is wondering. And these capabilities, as I said, are not as exhaustive as the back capabilities. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the functionality of continuous electronic monitoring that measures systems efficiency and informs building owners of uh, or managers in the case of significant variation and when system servicing is necessary. Effective control functionalities to ensure optimum generation, distribution, storage use uh, of energy and where applicable hydronic balance and the capacity to react to external signals and adjust the energy consumption. So this is entirely new provision as well for residential buildings. Uh, some of these capabilities were uh, already in the previous EPVD as a voluntary scheme. So if some member states wished to um, uh, wish to implement these, it was as a suggestion from the Commission. Uh, nevertheless, it was not taken up by any of the member states. Um, another uh, new provision coming are automatic lighting controls, uh, which will be have to be suitably zoned and capable of occupancy detection. And these are coming by 2027 uh, in large non-residential buildings, and then similarly to BACs by 2030 in uh, smaller non-residential buildings as well. Um, so these were some of the mandatory requirements that I just went through, uh, which uh, list specific capabilities. 
Uh, now I'd wanted to also mention some of the kind of the pool um, schemes that the um, Commission and the member states are working on in order to incentivize people to um, adopt um, smart building technologies. Um, so one such scheme is the Smart readiness Indicator, which has been around since the previous EPBD, but it has been only in a test phase, in a sort of experimental uh, stage where um, certain member states have tried it out, but not rolled it out in a full scale yet. Uh, nevertheless, with the new EPBD, uh, the Commission is mandated uh, by 2027 to require the application of the Common Union Scheme for the Smart uh, Readiness Indicator. Uh, this will have to apply to non-residential buildings with effective rated outputs above 290 kilowatts. And we are also involved in the Commission's working groups uh, trying to facilitate member state adoption because, of course, this implies uh, that... Um, so just to explain the scheme, uh, it is if you know energy performance certificates, um, it's something similar, but for the rating of smartness of buildings. So how uh, prepared they are to integrate with the grid, um, what kind of services they can provide, smart building services they can provide to the occupants, um, et cetera. So um, this is to incentivize um, building owners to invest so they can get a higher rating and also the prop show uh, the potential uh, buyers of, um, of property um, the value of these uh, installed systems as well. Um, so um, with this said, um, the rollout as well, uh, always with these schemes is, is quite challenging as we saw with energy performance certificates. So there can be uh, a lack of coherence across the member states. Um, so that's something we're working on as well to ensure that this scheme is, is rolled out in a more coherent and ambitious way um, and follows the common methodology. Um, some uh, more um, important mentions, I thought, that would be interesting for you as well. So beyond what I mentioned already with indoor environmental quality, uh, member states shall also set requirements for the implementation of adequate indoor environmental quality standards in buildings in order to maintain a healthy indoor climate. So this is a separate paragraph from the uh, specific back capabilities. Uh, this is just a more general statement uh, what the member states should uh, try to do. Uh, so this is more uh, at the member state level to define what exactly indoor environmental quality means for them and what kind of parameters should be followed uh, and uh, what thresholds of parameters uh, should should be followed as well. So there's no guidance as to any specific parameters or their thresholds, but rather that the member states uh, should set up such um, uh, such um, monitoring and, and implementation of these requirements. Um, another notable mention is uh, self-regulating devices and hydronic balancing. So self-regulating self-regulating devices were already uh, required um, in, in all buildings where uh, heat or cool generators are replaced. Now uh, it will also be required, uh, system balancing will also be uh, required in, in these buildings, um, in all new buildings and as I mentioned, yeah, existing buildings when uh, heat generators or cooling generators are replaced. And finally, some of the last points of the new provisions. Um, so previously, building automation controls were under Article 20, which was uh, uh, under another article, which was uh, related to inspections. And now they're moved under the technical building systems article, meaning that there will be less confusion in member states, whether this is a mandatory uh, requirement or not. Uh, there is a new um, challenging, uh, I would say, article that we are still wrapping our heads around and trying to uh, work with the Commission to understand, which is on data exchange in buildings under Article 16. Um, there is the mention of EN ISO 52120 for the first time in the uh, EPBD, which um, uh, qualifies now as a key European standard on energy performance of buildings, meaning that everybody who adapts these uh, requirements and energy performance certificates, et cetera, they need to take account of this standard. Um, and uh, back specifically now also included as one of the aspects that must be taken into account uh, for the calculation met uh, methodology of energy performance certificates, uh, which wasn't the case before. So what are we doing? Uh, as I mentioned, this is, these are the achievements at the European level. Uh, but what are we doing at the member state level in order to ensure 
uh, that um, this is actually implemented and also how are we communicating and how we suggest our members to communicate about this uh, in order to um, leverage these new provisions. Uh, so as I mentioned, the member states need to transpose these uh, requirements and they will be mandatory. Nevertheless, uh, we as companies, we as associations um, cannot go to the member states and say, uh, you know, threaten them and say, this is what you have to do. We don't have that authority. Uh, so we still find that we need to motivate them. We need to try to show them the added value, the benefit of why uh, this is of interest to them uh, to uh, implement these technologies as much as possible. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we've done is we commissioned a study which uh, will have a launch event at the end of this month as well, and you are all invited to join on the 28th of November. Uh, which uh, So the study uh, that we commissioned um, looked at the potential of uh, building automation and control systems um, if implemented on, on the, in the worst performing buildings, the potential of um, energy efficiency increases. Uh, but looking specifically at the energy performance certificates and what sort of jump in classes. Uh, so if you're class G building, class F building, class E building, for example, what kind of jump, jump in classes you can expect if you um, ambitiously implement building automation control systems. Uh, so what the study found was that you can expect somewhere between one and two class jump. Uh, so if you're, say, a class, uh, G, you could go to class E. If you're a class E, you could go to class D. Uh, and why is this significant? It's because together with all of the uh, requirements that I mentioned to you, uh, member states are also obliged to uh, renovate the worst performing buildings in their countries uh, to bring up the um, energy performance classes in those worst performing buildings by certain deadlines according to the new EPBD. So they will be looking at their portfolio of the of the EPC classes within uh, in, within each country, and they will be looking at the worst performing buildings, and they will be thinking what are the most cost effective measures that we can implement to meet these deadlines quickly. Uh, so here we come with a solution and say and this is a, a relatively easier intervention than a um, a major and deep renovation. Uh, that we can offer that you that can deliver you these savings that you are required um, immediately at a cost effective uh, manner. So this is the intention, <coughs> excuse me, of this study and that we will be promoting at the national level as well. Second, what we did after the previous EPVD uh, was also trying to explain what the new VAX provisions mean in practice. So spell out what exactly needs to be presented um, by the building owner, by the facility manager, or whoever is responsible for the building to the inspector uh, to show that, yes, my building complies with these requirements. Uh, therefore, we came up with the um, uh, compliance verification checklist for the previous, um, previous requirements in 2018. And now with the new extended capability of indoor environmental quality monitoring, we've also covered that aspect in the updated checklist that we've already uh, published and that's already being translated also now in German, French and Spanish. And um, another effective tool that we will be um, uh, providing to the member states in order to provide them with the tool uh, in order to uh, understand these requirements better, but also to uh, have something uh, at hand when they're thinking of how to uh, ensure compliance um, when they go to the building sites and they go to the buildings and see um, what, what they should look out for and what kind of documentation should be provided uh, when trying to inspect the buildings. Finally, um, beyond uh, these more kind of detailed um, uh, checklists, we also want to give them, the member states, uh, a more broader understanding of what the new requirements mean and how they should be implemented. Therefore, we uh, worked after the previous EPVD on the implementation guidelines um, in parallel to the Commission's guidelines. And that's what we've done this year as well. We haven't published these yet because we want to wait until the Commission is done with their guidelines because we do not want to uh, contradict them. We, of course, would like to complement them but not contradict them. So as soon as the Commission's guidelines are out, we'll be out with our uh, expertise, uh, technical guidelines for the different provisions that I mentioned today already. Um, and uh, this will be another additional tool at the member state level to understand the new provisions um, in the EPPD better as well. And what we'll do 
as well, of course, is the monitoring of the requirements um, at the national level. This is an overview that we have internally <clears throat> that we used also um, after the previous EPBD. So we were closely monitoring each and every member state. Um, what is the uh, legislation where the where the provisions are being implemented? What aspects are implemented to which level? Uh, is uh, uh, are the relevant standards followed? So what sort of thresholds are being set? Are they following the uh, commission's suggestions or not, etc.? So this is something that we were uh, providing to our members as well to better understand the market and better understand what they can refer to at the national level as well. So that is all from my side in terms of um, what the new provisions are, uh, what impact they're having, and uh, what we are doing in order to ensure that they're implemented at the national level. Uh, but now I would be happy also to talk to you and take some questions if you have in terms of uh, more direct, maybe more detailed questions or impact you'd like to find out. All right. Uh, wow. Uh, thanks, Gast. Uh, this is, uh, I'm happy we, this is recorded <laughs> because I <laughs> knew we need to go through this a few times. Uh, it's actually a lot uh, to digest, uh, but it's good. Uh, actually, I already opened up a Q&A, so uh, people who are attending, please, uh, there is a Q&A uh, tab. You can drop your questions. Even now, if you want to be on stage and, sh and share your audience video to formulate your question here is a great opportunity. Please, uh, you can do that by requesting um, sharing voice uh, audio on video. Uh, before the, going to the Q and A, uh, I made a few notes here while you were while you were talking. Uh, so I see there is a, an incredible uh, new landscape uh, opportunities for, uh, as it, it is said in the um, in the EPBD referring to bugs. But there is a lot referring to indoor environmental quality, uh, lighting, and HVAC. So this is, I mean, if we look at our members, uh, that's what they do, right? Uh, a lot of their systems, sensors uh, for indoor air quality, and uh, which is not very trendy, I must say. But we've been doing HVAC systems, zoning. Uh, one of the comments was um, HVAC, uh, zoning, separate regulation for each room. This is exactly what we have been doing for many years already. Or uh, monitoring, uh, energy monitoring, preparing uh, buildings for demand size response. This is what we do. Uh, that's what our members do. And I think uh, this opens a lot of opportunities for them. But there's something very significant you mentioned. Uh, I think it's a study from uh, University of Milano um, that says that mm -hmm. PACs can result in a payback period of just three, four years. So, you know, when we talk about the legislation and people try to uh, uh, align with what's happening, and but I think this type of information is what actually becomes really a selling point, right? That uh, I think that was also the case with uh, renewable energies. At the beginning, the cost of uh, kilowatts uh, uh, were very expensive, but it was dropping to the point that then uh, you could pay back your solar installation uh, quickly. Now, uh, with backs and uh, uh, the energy savings, uh, that you can uh, a payback period of three four years that's nothing compared to the to the lifespan of a building, right? So there is a significant uh, savings there, and I think this is a selling point that has to be used by the by the prescriptors, by the, uh, in our case, the system integrators who are putting the technology together uh, for those projects. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Really, really um, comprehensive approach. And we'll definitely uh, go through this recording a few times uh, again. And in order to, for us as a Kenex Association, to present this information to our members. All right. Um, Let's get a couple of uh, questions. Uh, audience, welcome to, uh, if you want to come and join with your camera uh, and your <coughs> microphone, please uh, request uh, request access uh, to that. That's why we've done it like this this year. We want to be very interactive. So if people want to uh, formulate their questions live, 
this is your opportunity. Uh, a couple of uh, questions we can use. Um, all right, so in your opinion, uh, Gas, uh, what specific opportunities does the EPVD create for uh, KNX members, which are in the domain of home and building uh, automations? And um, yeah, how can they leverage this to stay competitive in the market? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Um, so. Of course, I, I don't know your members very well in detail, but uh, just to just to give my idea of how I see it, uh, the EPBD brings um, real sort of tangible opportunities that I've shown through through the new provisions, uh, because it's pushing for smarter, more sustainable, uh, decarbonized buildings. Uh, so the solutions um, your members provide are, I think, well positioned, as you already alluded to uh, in, in in your summary. Uh, mm -hmm. to support um, uh, these new provisions and and uh, smart energy management and better in environment indoor environmental quality so uh, these are required these are not just a wish this is not just a benefit that we advocate for uh, that we need to sell uh, this is also a requirement coming from uh, uh, from from the european union and eventually at the member state level uh, companies can uh, I believe stay competitive by showcasing how exactly their solutions uh, not only uh, help buildings comply with this, mm -hmm. uh, but also what you also uh, alluded to is the payback time that we yes. can expect. Uh, and also, um, it's all, all interlinked. So uh, by implementing, by solving one uh, issue, uh, like uh, optimizing um, energy performance, optimizing indoor environmental quality, you're saving energy, uh, you're also improving your building's uh, um, energy performance certificate class, so meeting some other requirements. You're also improving the smartness of the building, uh, so improving the value of the building as a property owner. So all of these things combined, I think, is what creates the package sort of which can uh, help your members um, show, showcase their solutions and, and also sell them better. I think um, it's it's important for everybody, again, to understand that um, this has to be done at the member state for member state level. Uh, it's great that these uh, requirements come from uh, from the EU, but still like the local property owners, the local authorities, etc. Uh, they will look at what's happening at the national legislation. So they need to translate whatever is coming from the national legislation and refer to those standards and requirements that are coming there um, uh, to kind of align their product offering to align their package what they're offering to this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. apps i agree so i think this the epbd is a great in the end it's a driving force uh for uh, the buildings to get into this uh, uh yeah this new framework to understand energy efficiency to uh, to help uh the, to contribute to the actual uh, uh environment from the decarbonization perspective but also being more effective but in the end there must be those advantages has to be part of the package as you say uh, and also always the financial aspect is very important so those uh, payback periods are also relevant um one more comment uh well i think you pretty much uh, reply there about uh how can uh how the members of the kinex association which are mostly uh, backs uh, manufacturers uh, how can they position the solutions to align with the national legislation maybe mm -hmm. here the twist is do they need to do something special <laughs> or just you think mm -hmm. because there is demand they will look for them or mm -hmm. do you think they can do something to uh, align their mm -hmm. the portfolio with the epbd yeah so uh, i think it is making your portfolio and i'm sure a lot of the members are already thinking that way from the previous epbd but it's sort of to making your portfolio epbd ready or epbd compliant uh so uh making sure that whoever is selling uh the products who's who's talking about them who's talking to the investors understands what are the requirements coming and when uh, so I know that uh, there's been mistakes along the way now after the previous EPBD where sometimes the building owners or property developers know better than um, the uh, the salespeople on the ground uh, what requirements are coming and they're asking for it. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
I hope that the members can um, now understand these provisions that are coming uh, and uh, whichever way uh, the, the national authorities word them, uh, they will be aligned with, with the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Uh, so I think if they already now can prepare um, a look at these provisions that I have listed today, uh, understand how they're for, like which of the provisions, which part of the package their, um, their, um, their products meet, um, and create that offering uh, and, and uh, be ready at the national level, know when the deadlines are, already can communicate to uh, whoever they're selling their products to uh, that these are the provisions that are coming, this is what you should do. Uh, but then, of course, monitor as well what's happening at the national level. Uh, when the authorities finally uh, implement these measures, uh, then they can also refer to specific uh, national law as well uh, and, and be ready. Well. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate. As you can see, you were the first one today opening the, the event. So that's because we believe this is a very important topic. Uh, we appreciate your uh, input. It's a lot of food for thought that you provided today here. And uh, I believe our members are going to review your presentation quite a few times for them to really understand this new landscape and the business opportunities that this opens up. But in the end, we are in a great position to contribute here. We have a, a large experience uh, as a community, and I believe we will um, we will be an active player in the EPBD scenario. So thanks, Gast. Appreciate. Really enjoy your presentation.